The human being, known as Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens, is the only surviving member of hominids, a branch of the great apes. They are characterized by erect posture, bipedal locomotion, manual dexterity and increased tool use, as well as a general trend towards larger, more complex brains and societies. The spread of humans throughout the world with their large and increasing population has had a profound impact on the environment and millions of native species worldwide. One of the key advantages of their evolutionary success is a relatively larger brain with a well-developed neocortex, prefrontal cortex and temporal lobes. These enable high levels of abstract reasoning, the development of language, problem solving, developing social relationships and cultural development through social learning. Humans use tools to a much higher degree than any other animal. Humans are the only extant species known to build fires, cook their food, clothe themselves, and create and use numerous other technologies and arts. Human beings are resistant to any constraints being placed on their inner nature, and are the most socially variant species in the animal kingdom who have created more ways of structuring a family, communities, societies, more different belief systems and far more ways of expressing themselves more than any other animal. More than any other animal human beings are equipped for diversity, having a strong sense of individuality and a flair for creativity. This gives them a constant choice. In in certain conditions they can be one of the most dangerous animals on the planet, but given the right environmental and social conditions which facilitate social progress and evolution they can be a positive force for change and are able to manipulate conditions and their environment for the benefit of not just themselves but for other species and nature in general. Motivation is the driving force of desire behind all deliberate actions in human beings. Human beings share with all other living beings a desire to interact with and manipulate their own environment to create the necessary conditions for survival, comfort and well-being. Being highly developed social animals one of the most important of human needs is a need to belong. All human motivation is filtered through a prism of individual emotional and cognitive development which is developed in response to accumulated experiences of one's environment and social interactions. Motivation is based on emotion, more specifically on the search for satisfaction, a positive emotional experience, as well as an avoidance of conflict. P positive and negative is defined by the individual mindset relative to experience and emotional and cognitive pathway of development. From a very early age we are all put under pressure to conform and fit in with the expectations of others in society. Some of this pressure comes from the stress and pressure our parents are put through as a result of their own social status and social relationships, and this can have powerful effects on child development and impact directly on their own individual pathway of emotional and cognitive development. Right from the moment we are deemed capable of social interaction our toys, games, fairy stories, play activities, and education are designed to condition us to accept inequality, a social hierarchy and to be motivated towards conforming and fitting in with societal stereotypes influencing how we think, how we behave and how we interact with others. Opportunities to make use of our naturally long childhood through exploration, experimentation and discovery of our own natural individuality and creativity are kept to a minimum while it is assumed at every stage of our development that we are open to and willingly embrace mind control from authority, not just from parents and others but from religion and the government. Most strategies designed to reinforce conformity and acceptance of authority are based on denial of our central emotional need to belong through exclusion, threat of exclusion and placing us in situations of conflict and these strategies are employed from our earliest educational experiences. Within this is a certain amount of pressure to conform to societal expectations relating to our perceived role in society and throughout we are molded and shaped into predefined models of good citizens. Early on we are taught that the economy is the most important and that we should all aspire to become good model citizens and aspire to fit in with stereotypes of success so that we can be free, independent and contribute to the economy. As long as we conform and submit to that what we are taught and conditioned we are treated as being part of mainstream culture and thus included in society.
We are sold an illusion of democracy, freedom and civil rights by major political parties which have been pre-screened and approved to form governments. This illusion is usually presented as a desire to manage the economy and infrastructure in a way which best serves the needs of taxpayers. Taxpayer is a government term for a good model citizen who is socially included, considered part of mainstream society, and who works to contribute to the economy. Pre-screened and approved political parties are given assistance during election campaigns by other parts of the hierarchy to create the illusion of democracy and gather enough votes to form a government. It is a complete lie. We are living under a totalitarian empire which is headed by large multinational banking, corporate and business interests who are involved in the pre-screened and approved political parties who form governments and oppositions to manage the economy and infrastructure for the benefit of those who run and invest in these interests worldwide. Namely the shareholders, directors backed up by an army of economists, advisors and strategists and heavily supported by equally powerful media interests who dominate the mainstream media, press and broadcasting. These are further supported by the judiciary, legal system and police, the military and also by intelligence. A large part of the work of intelligence and secret services is to infiltrate all branches of the civil service and other important areas of our infrastructure to supply information from among the people and also take part in monitoring and surveillance activities. Austerity is one of the more extreme empire policies which has three major objectives. The first objective is to divert tax revenue away from reinvestment in the economy towards corporate profit. This is achieved by cutting public spending, welfare benefits and provision of public services. The second objective is to introduce inequality, debt and fear to the population so as to force them into wage enslavement. The third is to depopulate society by making the lives of people dependent on the state so unbearably stressful and hard that they either die prematurely or commit suicide. The general strategy here is to make sick, poor and marginalized people look for work on special websites such as Universal Job Match. There are an insufficient number of jobs available but these sites are full of fake vacancies and people are forced to make large numbers of job applications under threat of losing their income through benefit sanctions. Many are sent to work unpaid for profit making companies such as high street retailers and supermarkets as a condition of receiving benefits. Today more than a million people work full time in Britain but do not get paid for their work. Many of these people have serious health issues. The general strategy of austerity is to use poverty and debt as a means of controlling people, together with a further strategy of stigmatizing people who are deemed unproductive to society. These austerity policies are made more effective by the fact that social exclusion is an experience. Most people think of equality only in terms of themselves and the rest of society. Therefore many of those who are stigmatized by the government and media become shunned by the rest of society and isolated. The stress and hardship of which often triggers genetic predispositions to life-threatening illnesses such as heart disease, cancer, strokes, type 2 diabetes, a mental illness and depression which in turn can lead to suicide. The basis of the universe is creativity and interaction. The only constant in the entire universe is change. The universe as we know is constantly expanding. There is only one universe. The universe functions according to a set of laws and principles. You, everyone else and everything else in the entire universe are subject to the exact same laws and principles. Everything in the universe is relative, as has been established by Albert Einstein in his theory of relativity. It isn't possible to be a part of the universe without being relative to everything else in the universe. Interaction as we know involves action and reaction. But what about creativity? What is creativity really all about? Creativity is any form of interaction between the physical and metaphysical which results in a perceptible change in existence.
to understand what creativity is about you need to first understand the basic principles of existence. There are three basic principles of existence. The first is that everything which is created in the universe is unique and individual and never exactly the same as anything else which has also been created. The second is that everything which is created in the universe has a set of binary a dualistic set of characteristics which facilitate interaction and the functioning of a relationship. The third is that all change and motion which takes place in the universe is cyclical in nature. These three principles are all interdependent on one another. The entire universe exists on the principles of existence previously given. The universe is unique and individual. The universe is made up of two separate planes of existence, the physical plane of existence and the metaphysical plane of existence. The constant expansion of the universe is caused by interaction between the physical plane of existence and the metaphysical plane of existence resulting in perceptible change, or expansion, in the physical plane of existence. Anything which is living exists simultaneously in both planes of existence, the physical and metaphysical, and is independently capable of being creative. Therefore it is also true that anything which is living is composed of both the physical and metaphysical. All change and motion which takes place within the universe is cyclical, each creative cycle being individual, different from the previous cycle and also the cycle which follows. Creativity is synonymous with change. Change can be either dramatic or traumatic. Dramatic change promotes living existence and interaction between the physical and metaphysical planes of existence. Traumatic change works against living existence and interaction between the physical and metaphysical planes of existence. Traumatic change therefore promotes existence within a single plane of existence, whether it be physical or metaphysical. Death is an example of traumatic change. Any creative cycle involves interaction between the physical and metaphysical, both dramatic and traumatic change in approximately four equal stages which are illustrated here as examination a breakdown, inspiration, conception and application. The starting and finishing point of any creative cycle is that what exists and what can be perceived to exist. This creative cycle is universal and applies to any form of creativity in the universe. Culture is essentially the agent which brings creativity and interaction together to result in change. In animals culture is the awareness which determines the decisions and actions taken for example to obtain food, to mate and reproduce or to modify its environment. In humans culture is the shared awareness which determines the nature and quality of our interaction and relationships and which influences our identity, thinking, patterns of behavior and ways in which we interact with others. Culture exists on many different levels, for example national culture, regional culture, local community culture and even the culture of individual companies and workplaces, families and friendships and relationships between two people. While culture influences the nature and quality of our interactions and relationships it is relative to individual people, time and space. Therefore culture is never static or fixed, but changes and fluctuates in cycles in accordance with each new interaction. Just like creativity, change and interaction culture is dualistic in nature and is subject to both dramatic and traumatic change. This is extremely important, because together with human creativity culture is what motivates social progress and human evolution.
creative cycles are individual and as we know involve both dramatic and traumatic change. Often our creativity whether it is through the formation and development of ideas or through actions may involve numerous different creative cycles, each one individual, and each one involving both dramatic and traumatic change. It is important here to distinguish between creativity and reproduction, or the repetition of a creative process or cycle on the basis of a previous process or cycle. Genuine creativity necessarily involves change to the creative cycle or process, and working from a point in reality towards a point in possibility. The end result can be one of dramatic change, resulting in a successful outcome but more often results in traumatic change and failure. Much of what creativity is really all about is exploration, experimentation, trying different things out, and discovery. Human beings as we know are subject to motivation. Motivation is based on emotions and emotional reasoning. There are different motivating factors. For example the avoidance of conflict, the libido, seeking of pleasure and happiness, and also if we consider economic motives incentives. Both cultural and cultural awareness go together with motivation to determine the nature and objective of the creativity. The nature and objective of creativity may be either dramatic change or traumatic change, even though the creative cycle remains exactly the same. Cultural and cultural awareness enable someone to identify opportunity in their environment or interaction whilst motivation serves to determine the nature and outcome of the creativity and its objective. Therefore creativity, in particular human creativity, is influenced not only by culture and cultural awareness, but also by individual morality. Perceived dramatic and traumatic change is determined by the individual mindset, which is often influenced by cultural awareness, past life and relationship experience, objectives on the individual emotional and cognitive pathway of development, by societal norms or, conversely, by social exclusion. The basis of morality is a motivation towards traumatic change. This is because living existence involves existence in both universal planes of existence which are incompatible with each other and subject to different laws and principles of existence. There is a certain amount of pressure therefore to exert energy towards traumatic change which explains why crime is one of the easiest of creative activities to carry out. To now our instinctive emotional responses in conflict situations tend towards anger, destruction and violence. However people do have a choice in all situations but quite often, particularly in cases of crime and criminal activities, cultural awareness may be greater of a culture which lies outside societal norms. Quite often the culture of violent criminals is a culture of abuse, exclusion and hardship and people can only perceive opportunities for their creativity on the basis of their own cultural awareness and life experiences. Working towards dramatic change generally requires a greater effort and also a greater number of opportunities than for traumatic change. It is also worth remembering that choice, particularly moral choice, can exist as opportunities in culture, particularly within the criminal justice system. Studies in the past have shown that convicted criminals, including violent offenders and repeat offenders have a greater degree of creative ability developed as a result of their involvement in carrying out crimes. Within society the choice always exists and that choice is dependent on whether to simply incarcerate and punish offenders or whether to provide opportunities for offenders and criminals to work towards developing their inner creativity towards dramatic change. One of the key advantages of their evolutionary success is a relatively larger brain with a well-developed neocortex, prefrontal cortex and temporal lobes. These enable high levels of abstract reasoning, the development of language, problem solving, developing social relationships and cultural development through social learning. This is made possible by an extended period of conception. Unlike a squamate, a snake, a equine, a horse, a human baby is not born fully developed or indeed viable at birth. This process of extended conception involves interaction between the human brain and the environment so as to develop such things as neurological coordination, balance, and visual acuity. Much of human conception takes place after birth in a process known as neural Darwinism and this continues until the infant becomes fully viable between a year and a half and two years. This process of extended conception is essential to human evolution and a fundamental part of the development of the large forebrain area characteristic of humans as a species.
This is what also causes early childhood experiences to shape adult behavior and the emotional and cognitive pathway of development. This is because we have two types of memory. The first type of memory is known as recall memory which enables us to recall things such as facts, faces, numbers, and locations. Then you have another type of memory known as implicit memory, which is an emotional memory which records the emotional impact of early experiences. Implicit memory not only records the emotional impact of early childhood experiences but is also essential for our ability to develop our inner creativity. Implicit memory is a fundamental part of being able to process inspiration and transform it through our cultural awareness into the ability to envision creative output and develop ideas and concepts. It is also an essential part of transforming early emotional experiences and impact and inspiration into a feeling of well-being, feelings of hope and it also influences our ability to dream and conceptualize objectives, thus is also essential for developing a life script. Anyone can learn how implicit memory works by exposing themselves to familiar creative output, such as a well-known song, a movie. As you listen to the song or watch scenes from the movie you should be able to recall specific experiences and relationships, and feelings and emotions you experienced from such relationships, and be able to clearly remember places, facts, even specific words said in conversations at the time, which you would not be able to recall having not listened to the song or watched the movie. Very much in the same way people who are adopted have a lifelong sense of rejection. The actual event of the adoption took place soon after they were born, so they have no way of recalling the actual experience as they would not have had a recall memory developed at the time. But their implicit memory recorded the emotional distress of separation which leads to them experiencing a feeling of rejection from others. This extended period of conception also involves human development with regard to human interaction which is another fundamental area for development in humans. Here again we can see how human interaction works with creativity to result in dramatic changes and development. One can enhance the development of babies who have been born premature simply by human touch and stroking them for short periods. Physical contact and affection are both essential for human development as they promote dramatic change through emotional experiences and contact and this impacts directly on the development of the child. Babies who are not held, touched or picked up or shown any affection can actually die from being denied such contact. This can also impact on a child's development in other ways. Babies who are starved of affection and tenderness, being left to comfort themselves and cry themselves to sleep can also lead to feelings of insecurity, trust issues and lead them to grow up into adults who have serious issues with adjusting to living as part of a community or society in general. This can lead to the development of a susceptibility to social exclusion, behavioral problems, and to such issues as obesity and substance misuse. Humans are motivated to interaction and action through emotional needs, and often it is whether those needs become fulfilled or not, or how, which largely influence how such children develop into adults, how they think, behave and interact with others. This is how such conditions as obesity and substance misuse issues develop. There is an inability to form successful attachments as a result of past emotional experiences. Yet the motivation for behavior and interaction which results in positive emotional experiences and satisfaction remains. And where there is a reduced ability or opportunity to get such emotional needs fulfilled through contact with other people, those affected are often left with little alternative to seek emotional comfort through eating or taking substances such as drugs and alcohol. This is not a given, because humans are individual and have individual responses to emotional experiences. But experience of such early problems with interaction and intimacy increase the risk of obesity and substance misuse issues developing later in life as such a susceptibility developing. However this extended period of conception also exposes infants and small children to the life experience of their parents and others in their family and it is the actual life experience of the parents, and how easy or difficult their life is, which can directly influence and impact on early childhood development. This can shape not just the development of their emotional and cognitive pathway of development but also determine to a large extent how these children develop as adults and whether or not they are able to fit in with basic societal expectations.
However this is not a failing of human evolution but part of what being human is really all about. Nor is this specific to just humans, but is common to many different species of animal and plant life and is part of the development of cultural awareness and the ability to be creative and interact with one's environment. However what is specific to humans is the nature and quality of social relationships. It is the culture of such relationships, how caring and nurturing they are, how much conflict there is in the relationship, which forms basic cultural awareness and prepares the child to develop in accordance with the sort of community as society into which they will grow and develop as adults. There is no such thing as human nature or shared characteristics common to different people. We are all highly individual and we form habitual or cyclical patterns of thinking, behavior and interaction on the basis of our cultural awareness, our social relationships and the sort of environment we grow up in. Are we growing up in the sort of stratified society where we learn not to trust people, to fight for what we can get, where we can be exploited or taken advantage of for being honest, and where life can often amount to not much more than a struggle to survive and get the bare essentials for a meager existence? Or are we growing up in a more egalitarian society where the development and maintenance of good social relationships is essential for our survival, where empathy is important, reciprocity, a sense of community solidarity, and where from childhood we will need to develop completely different skills and follow a completely different path of emotional and cognitive development. Parents are often left with little alternative but to pass on skills and knowledge taken directly from their own life experience and it is this transfer of such skills and knowledge which is likely to remain with their children throughout their adult lives. We know that the expansion of the universe is dependent on creativity and interaction between the physical plane and the metaphysical plane of existence. The metaphysical plane can be seen as the spiritual plane of existence, and the physical plane of existence can also be seen as the natural plane of existence. However meta means beyond so metaphysical really means beyond the physical. These two planes of existence are completely different from one another. We know far more about the physical plane of existence because it concerns our concrete reality. It is made up largely of mass and matter and its interaction with the various forms of energy. So the effects can be perceived in terms which are accessible to everyone through senses and can be easily studied through science. We know that things in the physical plane of existence are predominantly finite. The metaphysical plane of existence is completely different. It is composed of different forms of energy and goes beyond Einstein's theory of relativity. It is believed to be infinite and thus the universe can only really be seen as infinite if we consider both planes of existence together. Because even though the universe is constantly expanding, we know from our knowledge of natural and physical sciences that the physical reality of the universe remains finite. Creativity is infinite because in essence it is interaction between the two states of being, reality and possibility, as well as interaction between the physical and metaphysical. Any creative cycle is simply taking a look at that what exists, exploring it, examining it, breaking it down, and then trying to come up with something better. Therefore in being creative you are working against ignorance. There are numerous reasons why investment in cultural development is essential to a modern, civilized society. Let's examine for example the greener ecological arguments about saving the planet. On a certain level the notion that we are destroying the planet by using up all the natural resources is a ridiculous one. One can apply the same sort of logic to claim that hard work damages your health and causes a mental breakdown. Please consider that you come home from work, or from any sort of activity and you are tired. In a purely physical world yes, hard work would be incredibly bad for your health because energy would be finite and you would end up dying from physical exertion. But you don't die, because you are also existing in the metaphysical plane of existence, and the metaphysical is constantly interacting with the physical. Therefore instead of dying you fall asleep and allow time for the physical and metaphysical to interact and restore your energy by the time you wake up. The metaphysical plane of existence, both in the universe and this planet is far bigger and much more powerful than mankind. 
we are not going to destroy the planet, but what is more likely is that this planet will replace human beings just as easily as it replaced dinosaurs. We are not an essential part of this planet, we are just one of millions of species who can become extinct just like any other. But that saying the greener ecological arguments are perfectly valid, we live in a universe based on action, reaction and interaction. Each time we mess around with the ecosystem of the planet there will be a reaction. Climate change is part of this reaction. While we are using up all the oil and coal in the planet, which took millions of years to develop, and minerals which took billions of years to develop, we are throwing away opportunities of developing the technology of using renewable energy sources. It's not the world which needs electricity, nor do the vast majority of animals living on the planet. It is humans who need the electricity in order to function. Just on our computers, tablets, and smartphones we use up vast amounts of electrical energy, not to mention the other uses such as transport, lighting, and heating. An investment in cultural development and development of human creativity would help us find renewable sources of energy far quicker. Investment in cultural development and human creativity would help us develop powerful and effective strategies to deal with numerous health and social issues. It would resolve unemployment, reduce crime, and involvement in creative activities such as art, music, photography and the performing arts lifts people out of addiction and is a powerful tool against mental illness and such conditions as depression and anxiety disorders. It is not possible to be creative without interaction with others and development of one's cultural awareness. This brings numerous personal benefits, such as improvement of cognitive functioning abilities, an increase in intelligence, greater ability to spot opportunities and calculate risks, improved strategies for interaction, communication and getting attention, and greater problem-solving abilities. Some people report development of psychic and spiritual powers. Cultural development inspires and stimulates creativity in others, and the sharing of creativity brings further inspiration and this gives people a sense of well-being and hope. This influences people to become more open-minded, receptive to others, compassionate, and understanding. Cultural development brings with it moral development and social development, promoting social cohesion and unity. This leads to greater opportunities which transform into greater economic opportunities and further economic development. Neglecting cultural development tends to very quickly start a process of cultural decline which can adversely impact on society and people's lives in quite profound ways. As we know any form of creativity towards dramatic change requires both interaction with others and opportunities. We also know that creativity towards dramatic change requires more effort in order to overcome the pressure towards traumatic change. What happens is that when there are no opportunities for creativity and no cultural development there are no outlets for people to express themselves and this can lead to them feeling stifled and experiencing stress. In many cases due to the natural human motivation to avoid conflict this can lead to apathy. Apathy-like inspiration can spread to other people quite quickly and this can create a cultural void of vacuum. This cultural void of vacuum sets off two separate processes. The first process affects human motivation and behavior. People are motivated to direct action through their cultural awareness, which includes experiences of environmental factors and social interaction. Human motivation is based not only on emotional need but also on a desire to express one's creativity through direction action and self-expression. Where there are no opportunities for self-expression or creative action people start to feel stifled, inhibited, stressed, and as a result become less open-minded less compassionate, more angry, more aggressive, and more open and tolerant of inequality. This sets off a process of cultural decline. This is because there is no cultural development working towards dramatic change or inspiration, so on the basis of tension and pressure caused by the incompatibility of both planes of existence the apathy and tension tend to work in the same way as inspiration, and this leads to traumatic change and traumatic cultural development, so that cultural decline results in social decline, social division, social stigma, and social fragmentation.
Within these circumstances various social issues which develop out of traumatic change and creativity, such as poverty, inequality, crime, social exclusion, start to develop. Some people perceive the moral decline inherent in such cultural decline and this causes a further reaction from some people which leads to authoritarianism and this in turn creates further social division and tension. This process of cultural and social decline effectively halts social progress and human evolution, and in some cases can reverse it. Since the mid-1990s the umbrella term for the various social issues which manifest as a result of social and cultural decline are known as social exclusion. The basis of being human is a basic equation between getting our emotional needs met through our ability to interact socially and with our environment balanced against our ability to perceive opportunity to follow through on motivation and be creative, sharing the results of our inner creativity with others, in order to meet our individual emotional needs. It is this simple equation which determines our ability to independently act and be creative enough with others in ways which we are able to exercise control and independently function to meet all our own individual needs, from basic needs such as providing ourselves with shelter, warmth, food and sleep through to more complex and abstract needs through self-expression through philosophy, religion, art, technology and business. For most people this equation translates in concrete terms to the fundamental basics of a lifestyle which is meaningful, productive and fulfilling. We all have needs for a stable and secure home, access to water, heat, a comfortable space and bed in which to sleep. We all have a need for some form of work and occupation through which we can acquire money in the form of an income, and through this provide for ourselves to provide clothing, material possessions, furniture, appliances, access to the creativity of others for our own emotional comfort and well-being in the form of music, books, movies, art, photographs. This also translates to opportunities to continue along our own individual pathway of emotional and cognitive development through opportunities to travel, to socialize, to take part in various cultural activities, and to develop specific intimate relationships to provide us with intimacy, sexual pleasure, acceptance, love, companionship and the sense of belonging to a relationship and eventually our own family. This is what goes together to make up a successful life for most people. Critical to the balanced functioning of this basic equation is the fulfillment of our need to belong, which forms our most important emotional need. We are all part of a triangular relationship not just with the people we interact with socially and our family, friends and loved ones, but also with the wider community and society. We need to belong to a social network to provide us with fulfillment of our emotional need for acceptance, for acknowledgement, recognition, for mutual understanding, trust, and to interact socially and also on a much more intimate basis. However we all need to have a sense of belonging to a wider community or society in order to be able to function as ourselves in accordance with our basic equation of who we are as individual human beings. If you diminish or take away that sense of belonging between the individual and wider society, whether it be through unemployment, homelessness, poverty, austerity or deprivation of an income, you invariably cause social exclusion and that person to become excluded from society. In excluding that person from society, or even by not including that person in society you rupture their basic equation of being able to function as a human being. This sets off the process of social exclusion, which can have quite profound and devastating consequences on that person's lifestyle, health and ability to function. Social exclusion is arguably the most prevalent of social issues which exist in society today. It is also one of the most difficult and resource-hungry social issues there is in today's society. This is because the primary characteristic of social exclusion is the perceived experience of social exclusion from the perspective of the individual affected. There are no external characteristics or features which enable someone to identify someone else who is socially excluded such as a person sleeping on the streets can be identified as being homeless, as someone who exhibits certain behavioral patterns might be identified as being mentally ill or dysfunctional. Pe people who are affected by social exclusion appear no different to others who aren't affected by social exclusion.
Furthermore, the fact that the fundamental characteristic of social exclusion as a perceived experience by the person affected makes it virtually impossible to provide any form of support through direct intervention without increasing the distress and negative consequences. Of this is because social exclusion is a process made up of different life experiences none of which may be connected, and the formation of the perceived experience of social exclusion may have been created by previous emotional experiences in different situations. It may also be caused by early childhood experiences or by repeated attempts made by the person themselves to address an issue which have so far resulted in failure. As an example one might assume that another person is socially excluded because they don't have a job, and might seek to intervene with the intention of helping someone overcome social exclusion by giving them a job. But this may only address one single component of the experience, which may create further distress, stress, a fear of failure and thus deepen the perceived experience. Another basic characteristic of social exclusion is that it is a process which can involve many dimensions and depths and it is almost directly relative to the health socio-economic gradient. This makes social exclusion somewhat less of an experience for more affluent people and easier to overcome. But the further you go down the social hierarchy the more multidimensional or deeper the perceived experience of social exclusion can be the more devastating effects are, and also the greater the likelihood that some of the effects can be terminal, life-threatening and even fatal. It's also important to remember that in being a perceived experience by the person affected, social exclusion cannot be characterized by widespread assumptions and notions simply because social exclusion does not conform to any set of general characteristics or features. For example you cannot make the assumption that people with poor health or who are disabled are less likely to be productive members of society and are thus more subject to social exclusion. People who are able-bodied and highly skilled can be affected by social exclusion. You cannot assume that social exclusion affects one particular group of people such as the unemployed, because almost as many people who are working can be affected by social exclusion. You also cannot base an assumption on lifestyle choices such as a tendency to drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes or eat unhealthily. Extensive research undertaken by Cultura consistently shows that only a minority of people affected by social exclusion drink heavily or smoke, and just as many people affected by social exclusion are height weight proportionate with healthy BMI as the single unifying factor in the perceived experience of social exclusion is the constant stress of living in poverty, with inequality or being deprived coupled with the instinctive distress associated with the unfulfilled emotional need to belong. The lower down the scale of social hierarchy you are, the lower your income level and the more you are marginalized or excluded by others, the greater the degree of stress you experience and the deeper the sense of emotional distress through the constant perception of not being accepted and not being perceived as belonging to a community or society. The reason why social exclusion is so stressful and distressing is that it often combines different types of poverty, such as economic or financial poverty with emotional poverty, into a single, constant daily experience. Quite often failure in one area leads to failure in other areas and this can have quite a profound and devastating effect on the individual affected. Symptoms of social exclusion include a diminished self of self-worth and self-esteem, impaired cognitive functioning abilities which can lead to impulsive behavior, an inability to deal with or solve problems, anger management issues, disruption to the circadian rhythm leading to disrupted and broken sleep, increased appetite, the downgrading of human emotional needs as a result of diminished social contact to food and alcohol and drugs which in turn can lead to obesity and addiction, to performance anxiety, depression, social social anxiety, and mental illness. It is important to remember that social exclusion is a process of traumatic change on an individual which often manifests itself into a sustained series of attacks on someone's mental and emotional health and ultimately, their physical health. 
people who are affected by social exclusion are often placed in a conflict situation where they need a greater degree of social interaction, cognitive functioning ability and creativity in order to overcome their experience of social exclusion, but end up not getting the social interaction a positive reaffirming social contact and inspiration which enables them to reverse the process and so are unable to develop for themselves a greater degree of cognitive functioning ability or creativity in order to overcome their experience of social exclusion. Subsequently this can lead to a triggering of genetic predispositions to serious, life-threatening illnesses such as heart disease, strokes, cancer, type 2 diabetes a further degradation to their mental health which can result in suicide. People affected by social exclusion often have a much reduced life expectancy, die more prematurely. They develop emotional barriers and trust issues with people who can support them, further cutting themselves off from receiving support, and may turn to crime or antisocial behavior as a way of seeking out the support and help they need to overcome social exclusion. Social exclusion not only affects individual people, but also has adverse effects for their loved ones, friends, relationship partners, families, and uses up additional resources and creates stress for many frontline public sector workers such as doctors, nurses, social workers, policemen, support workers and carers. Therefore social exclusion, despite being preventable, is becoming an increasing drain on public resources and the provision of services and support to others. The process starts when the UK government or Treasury requests to add £1 billion to the money supply. It contacts the Bank of England. The Bank of England has its own private supply of money which does not belong to any of the money which is in circulation in the economy. Additionally the private money supply of the Bank of England can be created out of nothing. This is different to the other banks, such as the clearing banks and retail banks, such as the NatWest, Lloyds and building societies such as the Halifax and Nationwide, who hold funds which are part of the money in circulation in the economy. The Bank of England provides the money to the government or to other banks as part of a special low-interest loans of say 1.5% or 1% and issues banknotes as a form of debt repayable to the Bank of England. The banknote, is which essentially an IOU note, has a written declaration which states I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of the value of the banknote. These special low interest loans are only made available to the government and other banks. However due to the rise in popularity of electronic banking only 3% of the money in circulation in Britain is in the form of physical banknotes. The money which is loaned to the government or other banks becomes legal tender in the form of pounds sterling and part of the money supply in circulation. This money is then loaned out to people at much higher rates, for example in the form of mortgages at 5% APR, personal loans at 10% APR and through credit cards at 20% APR. The £1 billion which enters the money supply is known as the principal. Under the fractional reserve banking system rules in the United Kingdom 3.1% of the principal must be held by the bank as a reserve. Therefore £31 million is held by the bank as a reserve. The remaining £969 million is considered the excessive reserve and can be loaned out by the bank with interest charged. However what happens is that this £969 million is added to the original £1 billion being created out of thin air. This is how the money supply is further expanded. Let's say a businessman wants to borrow the 969 million as part of a business loan. The bank issues him the money which he must deposit into another bank and the cycle repeats itself. The businessman deposits the 969 million pounds in the bank, which holds 30 million as the required reserve, and creates a further 939 million out of nothing on top of the original deposit to further expand the money supply. In subsequent transactions the cycle repeats itself with £910 million being created out of thin air and added to the money supply, then £882 million coming out of thin air, and so on and so forth. This can go on indefinitely.
But to keep it mathematically simple, the original £1 billion requested can become some £32 billion added to the money supply, £31 billion of which has been created out of thin air. This new money gets its value by stealing value from the existing money in supply, which creates inflation. This also means that all money is debt, therefore every single pound you have a earn or receive in income is money which is owed to someone else. However the fact that all this debt created has been created with interest charged against the principal, if all the debt in the money supply was repaid there would not be a single pound left in circulation. In addition to not one pound being left in circulation, there would still be outstanding debt as the interest would also need to be repaid. Therefore the only two possible outcomes in addition to inflation are increased poverty and insolvency or bankruptcy. John Locke was a 17th century English physician and philosopher. He is considered to be one of the most influential Enlightenment thinkers and is known as the father of liberalism. His social contract theory was also widely acclaimed and has also influenced capitalist thinkers, as well as political, legal and economic thinking. One of his major works was the Two Treatises of Government which was a work of political philosophy. In the first treatise Locke attacked the concept of patriarchalism as a form of government. The second treatise, part of which has been reproduced verbatim in the Declaration of Independence, was an argument of Locke's ideas of a civil society and a social contract. In the fifth chapter of the second treatise Locke argued that governments could not arbitrarily dispose of property and that everyone had a natural, God-given right to property in a civil society. He made the argument on the basis of three provisos. The first proviso was that there must be enough property left over for others. The second proviso was that the property must not be left to spoil. The third proviso was that everyone had to mix their labor to become entitled to the property. This all seemed plausible enough. If you go out and mix your labor with the world then you become entitled to a share in the property and goods available. But then it all falls apart in a single sentence. He states that there is enough land and property for everyone. However the one thing which blocks this is the invention of money, and men's tacit agreement to put a value on it. He doesn't go on to say that all his three previous provisos are cancelled and invalid, but this is exactly what happens. From that point forward there is no more entitlement to property or goods through mixing your own labor because it is later accepted that money buys labor. On that basis of the acceptance that money buys labor there is no longer any consideration as to whether there is enough left over for other people. There is no longer any concern for waste because Locke argues that money is like silver and gold and cannot go to waste. This this is ridiculous because nobody is really concerned about the actual physical condition of money, but what its effects are. But the argument continues built up by one logical fallacy after another. He accepts that there is inequality but does not suggest how to resolve it in his civil society. He suggests that the government should moderate the conflicts between capital owners and workers but makes no suggestion as how this can be achieved. In places his labor theory of value contradicts his supply and demand theory, but it meets the interests of capital and property owners so he gets away with it. Adam Smith was an 18th century Scottish moral philosopher, a key figure in the Scottish Enlightenment and the pioneer of the political economy. Smith is known for his theory of moral sentiments but is better known for his Wealth of Nations which even today is seen as the first work of modern economics. Smith is cited as the father of modern economics and is one of the most influential thinkers in the field of economics today. Admittedly the thinking that property was a God-given right and that God provided property and goods for people to enjoy was started by John Locke and his treatises of government, which as a result of its glaring logical fallacies allows for the unlimited accumulation of wealth and for inequality in society. It is also accepted that property is a right of private ownership. It is also accepted that money buys labor.
Adam Smith had a big idea concerning the important issue of market equilibrium, and sought to answer the question as to how supply can meet demand and how demand can meet supply. This equilibrium is of course one of the central notions of economics. Smith explains that equilibrium is achieved by the invisible hand of the market. The invisible hand was a very clear metaphor for the hand of God. So now we have gone from Locke believing that God provided us all with property to enjoy to Smith now claiming that the market is controlled by God, the invisible man in the sky. This is where the entire theory of Smith falls apart and becomes nothing more than a superstition a delusion. Please consider that we can replace the invisible hand of God with the invisible hand of Santa Claus and it would make just as much sense. This is not to dispute the existence of God, or indeed dispute the validity of any religion or religious belief. The metaphysical plane of existence in the universe is very real and exists because we have the reality of living existence to show it exists. The concept of interaction between the physical and metaphysical plane is not a new concept, but is the entire basis of religion and religious thinking. Religion has been teaching for many centuries of the conflict between good, a dramatic change, and evil, a traumatic change. All popular mainstream religions base their core principles on this basic conflict. People need to work out whether God is an anthropomorphized version of the metaphysical plane of existence, or whether God is an imaginary figure a deity. God cannot be both. The principles of the metaphysical plane of existence are totally different to the physical plane of existence. To most people the basic principles of the metaphysical remain as much a mystery today as they did centuries ago. The metaphysical plane is infinite, so it is possible for some form of God to actually exist, but, but it is highly improbable that the metaphysical functions in the same way as human thinking. Therefore more than two centuries after Adam Smith there is no concrete evidence of any invisible hand working to maintain market equilibrium, and plenty of concrete evidence to suggest that there is no such thing as market equilibrium. The reality of life for the majority of the world's 7 billion people is one of poverty and deprivation. 1 billion people are starving to death, while a tiny minority of the world's population are rich beyond the wildest dreams of most people. However in his Wealth of Nations Smith also states that in civilized society it is only among the inferior ranks of people that the scantiness of subsistence can set limits to the further multiplication of the human species and it can do so in no other way than by destroying a great part of the children which their fruitful marriages produce. So Adam Smith anticipated evolutionary sense in the worst possible sense. Adam Smith came well before Charles Darwin. Smith referred to workers as the race of laborers. As you can see there was inherent racism in these views. There was acceptance that the needs of the market could justify the genocide of children and that this was as a result of the invisible hand of God bringing equilibrium to the market, where supply meets demand and demand meets supply. Furthermore it was Smith who introduced the concept of moral worth on the basis of one's ownership of property and money and also the notion that the workers or laborers were a race of people inferior to capital Norian owners of property. You can also see here how there is no concept whatsoever of any sort of social responsibility or any sort of religious thinking inspired by helping the poor. Now you can perhaps see how many of the virulent things and ideas, together with the lack of social responsibility, acceptance of inequality and also acceptance of leaving poor people without money to die, things that you can see going on today in the current system, all come from the seeds that were planted by Adam Smith. In society today there is little or no concept of positive cultural development to the encouragement of people to explore and develop their inner creativity. Furthermore you never hear of someone talk about social progress or the state of their country in terms of their own emotional or physical well-being, their feelings of happiness, trust or faith in organizations, or their material or financial stability. There is no widespread or general feeling of hope. People are not talking about their ambitions or dreams, or life objectives. What you get instead are their perceptions on the economy are through economic abstract concepts, such as the gross domestic product, the retail price index, rates of inflation and the current value of the stock market. The average man in the street is more inclined to tell you about the difficulties and hardships he is experiencing. 
his fears about the future, perceived threats to job security, health and emotional well-being, or income. What does this tell us of real value as to the quality of people's lives? Nothing. All the information we receive either relates directly to the money sequence of value or the social effects of the disconnect between the money sequence of value and social progress. For example the gross domestic product is simply a measure of the value of a country's assets through the value of goods and services sold. This measure is claimed to directly relate to the standard of living of people in the country. As an example healthcare accounted for over 17% of gross domestic product in the United States in 2009. This amounted to over $2.5 trillion spent which in turn created a positive effect on but this particular economic measure. Connected following this way logic, of thinking, it would be even better the basis for the American for economy if healthcare services increased further, perhaps to $5 trillion. This would promote more jobs, more growth and thus be argued by the country's economists as a further rise in the country's standard of living. Furthermore sickness and ill health does not quite carry the same freedom of consumer choice as for other products and services. Nobody ever tells you that they are saving up to have their next heart attack and nobody has ever walked into a bank and applied for a bank loan because they want to contract cancer and go through the process of chemotherapy. This is not a joke or a particularly cynical perspective but the way things actually are in reality. Care to step back and take a good look at the situation you will realize that increasingly the gross domestic product is actually a measure of industrial inefficiency and social fragmentation. It cannot be seen in any context as a reliable measure of social or personal well-being among people. Furthermore, if you care to give this matter even more thought, you will realize that further economic growth and rises in the gross domestic product actually means further industrial inefficiency and the further development of social issues and the worse things are becoming on a social, personal and environmental basis. This has led to the widespread acceptance of the exploitation of social issues and personal hardship as an economic tool for corporate profit and economic growth. There is no incentive for profit under the current system in saving lives, working towards equality or social justice, or working towards justice, peace, cultural development or anything else. Likewise crime generates business, social destruction creates business, and while it is unspoken there is a business interest in keeping people sick, homeless, unemployed or jobless and generating profit out of their personal misfortune. In the United Kingdom the prison service is being transformed into an increasing number of private prisons run for profit whilst previously publicly owned prisons are being sold off to property developers and converted into luxury hotels and hostels. These corporations are trading on the stock market in London and Wall Street and their share values are based on the number of people they have in prison. This is sickness and dysfunctional, but this is also what this current economic system demands. Another primary motivation of the current economic system is the fundamental belief in perpetual economic growth caused by endless cycles of consumerism and consumption. When we examine the fundamental basis of modern market economics we find that the basis is a relationship of monetary exchange which cannot be allowed to stop or be slowed down if society is to remain in any way functional. Center stage in this economic theater are the employer, employee and consumer. The employee supplies the employer with labor in return for an income. The employer sells goods and services to the consumer for income. The consumer of course is simple the employer or employee in a different role spending the money earned back into the system to enable to cycles of consumption to continue. The global market economy is based on the assumption that there will always be enough product demand to move enough money through the system at a rate which can keep the consumption process going. The faster the rate of consumption the greater the economic growth assumed and so the beat goes on. But isn't the whole purpose of the economy based on the efficient and economical management of resources for the benefit of everyone in society? How does the current economic system work to achieve the objectives of a traditional economy? It doesn't. 
The objectives of the current economic system are in direct opposition to all the objectives a proper economy should have. We live in the concrete reality of a planet composed mainly of mass in the physical plane of existence and have at our disposal only a finite number of resources. We are consuming huge quantities of oil, a finite substance, which took millions of years to create. The minerals we are currently using in large quantities took billions of years to create. So to be a part of an economic system which promotes the endless consumption of finite, physical resources which we have no possibility of replacing is an ecological form of suicide and a form of collective insanity. Efficiency means an absence of waste, yet this economic system is far more wasteful than any other system in the history of mankind. We are in a state of rapid cultural decline and this is coupled with an accelerating degree of social decline. No academic paper published anywhere in the world in the last three or four decades will tell you anything different that every aspect of our society and culture is in a state of decline. Try to think of any system or any means of life that isn't in direct threat or danger by the current economic system. Nobody is thinking about the causal mechanism. However this is the causal mechanism, the rapid degree of cultural decline tied together with an accelerating degree of social decline caused by a disconnect between social and economic development. The causal mechanism is the emphasis of economic development to the detriment and willful neglect of social and cultural development. Awareness of the metaphysical plane of existence is not a new concept but one which has been with us for centuries. Right through our history mankind has sought to explore beyond the physical towards the metaphysical to work out the meaning and purpose of life and to explore what can possibly happen after death. Not everything is finite in our existence. In the course of our lifetime we make use of infinite amounts of energy limited only by the reality of our finite physical existence. Our capacity to learn and understand is infinite if we only bother to make the effort. The same is true of our compassion, our creativity, and our ability to seek and discover the truth. The fundamental basis of religion is the conflict between traumatic change and dramatic change and the need to be creative enough to work against traumatic change and its effects through interaction and creativity. This is why many religions provide opportunities for social interaction with other people, opportunities for study and exploration, and opportunities for creative activities and to bring positive change to the lives of others through charity work. Yet more than anything else religion has been exploited by mankind as a tool for mind control, to spread inequality, and to create hatred and division between people. We have seen this in the doctrines of Adam Smith, the moral philosopher and pioneer of modern economics who advocated the killing of children born into poverty for the sake of the market. We see this in numerous wars and conflicts, particularly in the Middle East where numerous conflicts involve human beings killing other human beings. Furthermore religion has conditioned people to submit passively to authority, to believe and not question, and to follow established rules rather than encourage people to explore, experiment, and discover solid principles on which to base their moral and spiritual thinking. This has disempowered a large number of people who, conditioned and trained to passively accept authority, live in an existence where they can clearly see the problems and issues taking place around them, but rather than try to do something about it, sit back in the hope of a messiah or other authority figure to come along and make the required changes. This can be seen not just in religion, but also in politics. Religion is not any different from life. The choice is there, the choice is within everyone and it exists, irrespective of whether the mind control is forced or whether it has been submitted to willingly. As we sit back and allow the world's economists, politicians, bankers and corporations to destroy our culture, our society, our lives and the planet for the purpose of some fictional game and nonsensical beliefs the universe continues to expand through creativity and interaction. We are not destroying either the planet or the universe, as both are bigger and much more powerful than mankind.
The only thing we are destroying are ourselves. What you are seeing is the creative cycle in action. Austerity is traumatic change. It is the opposite to creativity, because the deficit is fictional as it is based on monetary values. All money is debt. Given the fact that fractional reserve banking allows money to be created out of nothing, an interest charged against the principal, even if we were to repay the entire deficit there will still be money owed. But austerity depends on taking money away from people, from services, from welfare benefits, and out of the economy for the sake of some arbitrary and made-up debt. The only thing you are creating out of austerity is poverty, and you can see this happening all around you if you care to pay enough attention. The ultimate result of austerity is not destruction of the planet, but depopulation, and the deaths of people through poverty. We are living in a world of 7 billion or so people, but 1 billion of these people are starving to death. They are not starving to death because of a lack of food, but because they don't have money for food. Millions of people in Africa are dying of AIDS. This is not because AIDS is untreatable and fatal, because we have people in the West who are living with AIDS. People in Africa are dying of AIDS because they don't have the money for treatment. There are people in the world who are homeless, not because there are no empty properties or space to build homes, but because they don't have the money for somewhere to live. You can go through every single social issue on the planet and reach the same conclusion. People are dying because they don't have money to survive. Creativity is a process. When the process becomes a problem the solution is very simple. You simply reverse the process. There are only two types of change in existence, traumatic change which works against living existence, and dramatic change which works to promote living existence. Everything in existence is relative to everything else. If you see the present situation we are in as an outcome, and relative to what has gone before then yes, you see failure, you see destruction and you see poverty. However if you look at what's happening and reject the current system as having any sort of validity, then that what you see is opportunity and where action needs to be taken. You are a human being, Homo sapiens. You are a great ape who has learned through 1.4 million years of evolution the concept of civilization. You are naturally equipped to deal with the current situation, for you have a larger brain, the ability to interact socially and the ability to learn about your environment through social learning. Within you are amazing powers of understanding, compassion and creativity which if you only make the effort to explore and discover can bring positive change not only to your living existence but also to the living existence to others and to the world around you. It is your humanity which makes you equal to others and everyone else equal to you. Inequality is no more than a social construct designed to keep you in your place and to serve the current system. You have equal access and opportunity to influence culture through your ideas, decisions and actions. If you only make the choice to become aware of the world around you, to seek the truth, and to create your own solutions. That choice is constant, and you always have that choice. You